Content warning, this video contains mentions of abuse and manipulations. I also have to request none of my viewers contact or harass any of the people mentioned in this video. So, okay, let's talk about a self-help guru, I'm sorry, life coach that I theoretically side with. Let's talk about Hun Ming Kuang. His autobiography calls him a spiritual teacher, professional artist, social healer, life coach, and community leader, which is just like mwah, perfect for the topic. Side note, the self-help video is banned in Singapore due to a defamation claim by one of the subjects, and I am not paying for his causes because fuck that shit. For example, the main subject on my previous video, host seminars and community events, Disconnect Today is a grown-up movement, advocacy platform, mental health awareness, community, blah blah blah, buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. I have independently confirmed that the subject on my previous video have targeted people undergoing career transitions, living with mental illnesses, and undergoing cancer treatment. Like this Reddit user who contacted me after the subject on my previous video filed a suit to have them take down their comments. I'm going to keep repeating this. He's just a guy. He's not a psychiatrist or psychologist. He's not even a trained counselor or therapist. He's an architect. So he's been looking for somebody who could save him Instead of searching inside for what they gave him A strong will, strong mind causes mayhem We could change the world, change times, rearrange them I want to ask some uh, general questions first, right? Um, so, how long were you in disconnect or studying under Ming Kuang? Roughly four months Four months How long were you stuck? within uh, uh, disconnect with Hong Ming Kuang. Okay, so uh, it's roughly about a year. You were roughly about a year? Yeah. So, it's from the point, from the moment that you... Met the founder to our incident. Uh, it will be about a year. Yes. Okay, so I was stuck there for six months. Six months, okay. Hi, Aiden. Six months. We met at an event organized by a coaching school. What was it about? Ming Kuang that drew you to him in the first place? Is it like charisma? Um, not actually drew me to him, not exactly charisma, but his partners. So my first impression of him was like, him suddenly appear out of nowhere, um, saying that, oh, uh, this is the person, um, like, like spirits has been telling him that, um, like this is the person he was supposed to meet, and then he just suddenly appeared out of nowhere, and then started talking to me, and then, uh, Apparently, like, as we were typing, he kind of, like, um, since what was going on, be in my life or something like maybe it could be the community manager I've told him. I wouldn't say charisma, but it's just, like, he knows what he's doing. It's like he's picking up the right words at the right time kind of thing. Yeah. And what about disconnect? Uh, do you... So... This connect was very weird. You sign up as a volunteer and you had to pay as a volunteer. So you basically pay six hundred dollar per person to pay for logistics. But the logistics there's no actually there's actually no logistics at all because they are just basically reusing the same items uh being put into one place and you bring the, that particular item to the event hall itself. But the people who attend this connect already pay our entrance fee, right? Yeah. So this is on top of the entrance fee that you had to pay. Let me talk about the volunteer agreement. So this volunteer agreement basically, so before you sign, they ask you to pay six hundred dollar for the logistics. That doesn't sound very volunteer. Yeah, it's not volunteer at all, and you pay you pay additional for the entry fee. You also pay additional for the entry fee. Yes, correct per person. As a volunteer. Yes, as a volunteer. During this connect, roughly how many people will attend each session, and how many of them are volunteers, and how many of them are just outsiders? So usually volunteers is around I think less than ten. Participants usually around like it can range from uh, fifteen to twenty. So about average fifteen. Fifteen to thirty. The highest was forty at one point. So how they get participants is basically they ask each volunteer to bring a, to have a KPI on the number of people that you are bringing into the event. And those people must be new blood. That means there be people who never went to this event before. If let's say uh your KPI is five and you only bring two people, you have to pay the the amount of the people that you did not bring. So you always have to pay the amount of people. Correct. So it always hit the the expected amount. So if you're talking about expectation amount, right? TC is sixty people, and SF 
the so-called private event is, I believe, is 45. So no matter what, 50 times 60 and 50 times 45. Uh, let's go back to the recruitment entrance fee first. Originally, there wasn't any entrance fee. But um, for the volunteers, wise there wasn't any, not that I know of. Um, for the participants, yeah, the, uh, for the participants, like those people that we recruited, it was about 12 to 25 and subsequently slowly increased to 50 and even 70. The short fall that the volunteers have to pay up, it used to be like none, subsequently become a 50 and then they decided to raise it up to 100 because they felt that 50 wasn't enough. Per short fall. Yes, per short fall. They felt that um, the volunteers aren't feeling the so-called pain. To the point that like, they didn't want to let the entire volunteers group go until the next day like 7am and accept this $100 in order to let the rest go. I think some of them even have like work the next day. That's collective punishment. Uh, he threw markers and um, erasers at the volunteers to get their attention. He's like, oh, you throw it at Totally physically. Yes, physically. He will shout super loudly. It was like a very intimidating feeling. Like, he will call us stupid, pathetic, and he will shout all this, you are stupid, you are pathetic, you can't even get simple instructions, right? This is why your life is like this. This is why your life is fucked up. So, um, during your classes with him, right, was he ever, like, uh, abusive or yeah he shot at me in public he shot at you yeah. in public shot at me um, very very loudly are you feeling it do again that kind of thing in public yeah in public does he do a lot of his session in public yes okay so the thing is we were supposed to do it in a private place i even paid for the private place and then halfway through he said this place is not available anymore let's look for another place can we do here and it's public so from then on we kept going to that place sometimes another place that's nearby then sometimes we go to that place and then there's people walking around and then he say it's my fault because I'm attracting distractions. What the f- <laughs> The anger outburst happens sporadically, in private and in public. Usually in public, it invited more embarrassment but in private, it elicited fear. They normally occurred when we were working on something and he was upset over the quality of work or progress. I eventually left because the abuse was too much to bear. I was having panic attack from the workload and the stress of planning events with him, being scolded vulgarities at 2am in the morning for not finishing work. Towards the tail end of working with him, he threw things at me and towered over me, told me he will push me onto the road or off the building. And uh, are there any other like weird things that he does out, out of the norm things that you can recall? I think I remember right, there's this particular class, physical class I did right, and then he asked everybody to breathe, keep breathing, so I think like you were hyperbending it. What happened was that we all like were moving uncontrollably. So you he forced you to hyperventilate. He asked you to breathe, keep breathing, breathe, 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 and then fast. Yeah, fast. It go faster, faster, faster until you hyperventilate, and then your. So I remember for me, my body was moving uncontrollably. It was a whole room, and everyone had to lie down, and it was just a very creepy feeling. Now that I think back on it, he forced us to breathe at a certain tempo, a really, really fast tempo. And he would force us to recall things, he would force us to speak out loud about what we want to say. So the whole room is just these noises of people speaking, crying, grunting. Like my body, like I couldn't move my body at all. But I, I had experienced this before when I hyperventilated. So I recognize it as hyperventilation. And during that time, how much money did you spend on them? In total, I would say around uh, more than 30k. More than 30k? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Four months' time? Yes. Um, inclusive of that, uh, I have calculated roughly about half a million. I paid for two workshops that cost approximately 2k plus in total. I don't think it was losing money as they were workshops that were delivered. It was probably more of a questionable sales ethics as I felt pressured to sign up. I would also pay for his meals, cat fare, some crystals that he wanted. He had me transfer another person's money, probably in the range of 3k plus in total. It was an unconventional approach. He would stand at the counter and wait until I paid or walked out of the shop. He usually did not explicitly ask me to do it, but I felt socially pressured to do so. There was also power play involved. There were a few times I asked if he would pay. He would ask me to pay instead, and I said okay. 
Hi Miss Tan, my name is Aiden Ng, a documentarian. I'm making a film taking a look at a self-help group and life coaching as a whole in Singapore. Given your background, I am wondering if I can ask you some questions about the subject from your position as a member of parliament. Thank you for your time. I hope to hear from you soon. Sincerely, Aiden Ng. Hello Miss Tan, regarding my previous email, I am still hoping to hear a reply from you. I also have questions regarding your relationship with an individual by the name of Hun Ming Kuang and how much help you might have provided in his endeavor as stated in a past interview you gave in the Southeast Asia Globe. I sincerely hope to hear a reply from you as the documentary will be made regardless and more information will be helpful in clearing up any potential misunderstandings. Sincerely, Aiden Ng. Hello Ms. Tan, I am forwarding a series of email I sent to your official PAP email in hopes for a reply. In case this is your main email of use, thank you for your time. Sincerely, Aiden Ng. Hello Mr. Chua, my name is Aiden Ng, a writer and documentarian. I am working on a project regarding some in summary, uh, I am making a documentary Kong, on a specific self help I understand that has scammed and coerced his followers out last sum of money, but specifically I am asking to get an I have some requests of the legal Hello, process. My name is Aiden Ng, an indie documentary filmmaker. I'm currently working on a film about a specific Hello, my name is Aiden Ng, a writer and documentarian. I am currently working on a film about self help scams and cults. I believe you were in some of the subject you the series. I am wondering if you will be able to answer some questions. Thank you for the time, and I hope the interview and of the person you question. Thank you for your time. I hope to hear from you soon. Sincerely, Aiden Ng. Working on a documentary is very different from my usual video essays. When working on a video essay, you are the story, your morals and feelings, your ideals and journey. For documentaries, that shouldn't be the case. The story is the story, at least that's what we were taught in school. I know that doesn't seem like it with the direction of my last two docs, but it is. At least, that's the norm. There are, of course, artistic exceptions. And I've tried really hard to distance myself from this one as much as I can. But over this past year, after being dragged into Hun Ming Kuang's orbit in my very first video on him, I realized I can't give you the ending without telling you my experience in the course of this investigation. Even with all these interviews with victims, hearing about all the terrible things that happened to them and all the nonsense of my prior videos combined, I still can't paint you the full picture if you don't understand what I had to go through to get this video made. So, one more time, let's get started. To begin, you need to understand a little about Singapore's laws and legal culture. Singapore has anti-defamation laws on the books. That's not very unique by itself. Many countries have similar laws. What is unique is that Singapore's government has consistently used them throughout history against their critics. I'm not here to argue whether or not those users were right or wrong, just that they were. They have set legal precedents, is what I'm saying. It has created a culture that if you accuse anyone negatively, even just public criticism, you can get sued. And also a not unsubstantiated mindset that these accusations doesn't even have to be false. Truth is therefore suable here. And it is with one of these laws that Hun Ming Kuang filed his slap suit last year against one of his critics. That's the reason why my first video is banned on YouTube in Singapore. It's the reason why I don't even say his name throughout my second video. And it's probably going to be the reason why this video might get taken down in the future. This culture is so screwed up that I can't even legally say that Ming Kuang stole from his followers in this video. Which is why I am specifically not saying that. Because that can be considered defamation. The reason why I can even say his name here is because of these brave victims. Despite threats, trauma, and abuse, they have decided to step forward to share their stories in hopes of helping others. 
allowing me to turn this video into an investigative journalistic piece instead, giving me that much more foundation and wiggle room to keep this video alive. And it is under these conditions and mindset where I set off to investigate this story. My first order of business after the interviews with the victims was to contact experts and that's when I ran into my first roadblock. Turns out, there are no experts on this topic in Singapore, at least none that I can find with my limited resources. Let's not even talk about open and prominent communicators like Gilly Jenkinson or Janja Lilik. I can't even find private specialists on the subject. I've contacted police, investigators, doctors, counsellors, therapists, journalists, lawyers. Surprise, surprise, nobody knows how to publicly talk about this subject. Somehow, I find myself the foremost public expert on this topic in the entire country of Singapore. And if you haven't noticed, I am an idiot. How? Why? What? And that's when it hit me. If finding expert help is so hard for me, how hard must it be for the victims? And I understand you've also filed a police report. Yep. Uh, how did they respond? I think they are aware of the situation. But they are also like uh, have their hands tied because of how how grey the, the law is. From my understanding, there are other victims who have already reported before me. And the investigation officer even told me that the amount that I lost is not the worst. Indicating, indicating that there are more losses from other victims that went through worse scenarios than I do. I understand you filed a police report. Yeah, I did file through because um the officer in the end, he didn't forward me the, the thing that I had to fill in. So I could ask someone else um, who filled in the police report to send that to me. And it got delayed quite a bit, so I haven't gotten the time to actually fill it in properly. But it, the officer was supposed to send it to you? Yeah, right? supposed to. Right. So it's already a bit delayed from the... Yes. Uh, okay. There were no follow-ups from the police. There were many reports that happened after me, and before me perhaps. From what I understand, there wasn't much constructive follow-up or action taken. The next thing I did was try to contact people from Ming Kuang's past. This was supposed to be the hardest part, but thankfully I was approached by someone who was part of that past, who wanted to share their story, saving me a lot of legwork. This whistleblower came from the same coaching schools that Ming Kuang did, the one which I found in my first video, and only touched on briefly. And I will continue to only touch briefly, because they have a lot of money, and I'm not ready for that shit. And my talk with the whistleblower was incredibly illuminating. Our entire conversation was over two hours long, so I won't be able to show you everything in this video. But needless to say, I confirmed many of the suspicions I had about the culture of disconnect. It turns out, a lot of disconnect tactics were replicated from these prior coaching organizations that Hun Min Kwang was part of. Okay, uh, thanks for uh, letting me ask you more questions in such a short notice again. Uh. No worries, happy to man. This okay, yeah. contracting is... It's, it's not really a contract. It's like a... It's a, it's a written agreement. Uh, I forgot what the 10 points was and I, I want to go and dig if I have the form. But basically it's like... Uh, it's you, you, you sign it and then it's an agreement to like, you know, behave well in the, the play. Uh, simple decency things. And I put... It's, it's, it's also very like self-improvement driven stuff. Okay, so Ming Kuang also make his people sign this. You are 100 percent responsible for your reality do your work exact same thing be of personal business sexual integrity exact same thing time integrity be punctual exact same thing okay this is a teacher student relationship exact same line okay you agree to use the materials taught in the class only for your personal progress exact same line the truth versus your truths Everything that happens around you externally is a reflection of what is happening inside of you. Okay, you are a master uh-huh. of your own rea- I, I'm starting to see a pattern. <laughs> Private and confidentiality? Yes, yeah, same. Oh god. Okay. <laughs> Copy and paste. You honor Hu Min Kuang for being your source of inspiration and light. Okay, this one might be... That one is him. <laughs> you are 100% responsible for your reality. This just seems like point number one again. From... From what I gathered for this, right, is that he um, makes them sign this as kind of like a legal fear tactic. Um, and from what I understand from like lawyers and stuff, right, this has zero legal binding. You're, you're right. Uh, it's so, so it does scare people. The honest truth is that it's a very standard uh, like class. Uh, and like when you're teaching and when you're in like any form of L&D, right, it's very standard to use psychological contracts. 
uh, to establish some form of relationships. Professionally, I also do that. I don't even talk professionally. Like, we run Dungeons & Dragons, right? X card is uh, like roleplay to your best ability, you know, don't matter game. These kind of things that are very neutral. It's just to, like, hey, this is the level. This is, this. At, we are all, uh, let's have a, a, a playing field where it's safe for everyone. It's more like yeah. a social contract to prevent interpersonal thing than a legal issue, right? Correct. It's one more layer. Then, then he, you. This is what the best uh, cult leaders will do. They will use a lot of truth and a lot of things that sounds correct. And then you sprinkle like shit, like you respect Ming Kong as the Lord and Savior. Uh, you, you you spoke a lot about a uh, community manager. Can you elaborate on what uh, the community manager is? By means of community manager, um, her name is Chu. So originally, what I understood that what she does was actually uh, helping um, Ming Kong. Doing his, um, I would say like, um, his time scheduling. Uh, it seemed like she was the uh, Ming Guang's key. Can you tell me how you got involved with the group in the first place? So my friend was already in the disconnect. So they invited me out for dinner one day. And usually they invite me for dinner, so I didn't suspect anything. But on that day, they brought Chu. I kind of had an idea what they were doing really because they were telling me, oh, I've, I've been doing this um, life coaching slash therapy thing, but I'm not allowed to tell you what it is because it's uh, private and confidential. So I kind of knew what they were doing already. But during that dinner, they brought Chu in and Chu was the one who um, kind of recruited me into Disconnect. So there's about 60 people who will go to each Disconnect section. And how many of them would you say convert? To, to the next level. This means like uh, join the classes, yes. right? Join the classes or go to Soulfield or further on. I don't really know the number, but they are very persistent. If, if they can't get you to sign up on the day itself when you join the event, they will host one on one coffee with you. And I believe this is a very known technique. I think a lot of people know about it. So uh, what they do is they have one on one coffee with you and then halfway through the conversation about having regular conversation, somebody will just suddenly appear. And then two person will target rocking on you and ask and hard sign to buy the course. There were a lot of like community members that were on the I think I mentioned to you the enrollment path that would go and set up all these meetups and they will host a lot of these things. And meetups like this, they charge like ten dollars or some of them free. It's just a gathering group. It's it's very predatory in nature. This is my opinion of course. Um, um basically because people that are interested in topics like self help uh, people that are interested in coaching and things like that there's a propensity for for them to be a bit more vulnerable so they, they, they are in those spaces is a lot more safe is a lot more inviting uh, there is less uh, you, you see less outward like talking about ECI and things like even though there is mention of it it is asked and sometimes the people running the sessions will talk about it um, it's usually the conversations that happen in between where like they will have a lot of time to mingle and chat can you Tell me, like, what was it about Ming Kuang that drew you in the first place? Just now you were sharing that he sort of picked at your vulnerability at the moment. Yes, yes. And um, it's not just him. I think it's also because of all the other um, so-called volunteers and people who have been in his classes for a longer time and their testimonials, especially Chu, because she, she tells me a lot about how terrible she was in the past and how much she has changed and how grateful she is for this experience. Because my friend, I think my friend kind of pre ended Chu about my life situation. I was going through some hard times. Like, so um, Chu already kind of knew that I was trying to look for an alternative solution other than therapy because I've been to therapy. And she started introducing the course that my friend was doing. And she said, um, your friend's doing this anyway and she has benefited a lot, she has changed a lot. Um, why not you take this chance to enroll? So I really felt that um, whatever doubts I have is like maybe just me being not open minded enough. Right. Yeah. So it's not just a um, main ground, it's like other people's testimonials also. And plus the fact that my friend was also doing it. Yeah. But going back to Ming Kuang, he uses a lot of. I wouldn't say intimidation, but he felt quite intimidating from the start also. Um, he pinpoint a lot about um, 
specifically my generational trauma and he also said stuff like you have a lot of shit going on I can feel it stuff like that which made me more inclined to believe that if I seek him for help like I can actually fix some of my issues in, in hindsight do you think he was he was right or was he just saying something quite generalised I feel like a real life shit yeah. so back then I was really at a point where I was looking for alternative so I was I, I wanted to give this a try um, what I didn't expect was all the emotional manipulation, the extortion, and like all the other shit that came with it. Right? So uh, the breaking point for um, uh, me to quit the group was one thing, the financial part of things, because it amounted to uh, like thousands, hundred thousands of amount, but to a point where I have to ask uh, loved ones around me for financial assistance. Um, second thing is that um, because I was one of the recruiters, I had to fork out my free time to go to like networking events to reach out to people that I just met and say that hey, I have sorry, excuse me, yeah. to a point where I'm like I have to um, meet um, networking events people. To get to know them and then like try to tap on their weakness or any like us pain points to bring them to the event. Yeah, community members that come in, um, that that will they will like talk to you and like oh how are you doing and then they'll share a story about oh this program has really changed my life. They will always come out. Uh, I I I mean when I was in there, so I would I I cause I thought I was doing the right thing. I would go in and I would uh, I would. Yeah, so I'll be like, yeah, yeah, it was really good and things like that because it, your psyche changes a lot. Yeah. So, so, so that's what happens. I, I did a bit of research as well. Um, the, this whole set, this, this whole framework came way, way out, all the way back to um, the, the, I forgot the guy's name already, but uh, the one, sure. one and a half. And then I come from well, US and then some of them, oh yeah, we need to enroll people. I'm like, oh, okay, right. Like, they're still using the same language. We've already covered the problem with the International Coaching Federation and their lack of oversight in my previous video. But another thing I found out during the course of this research was that not only is coaching not regulated in Singapore, but the majority of the mental health field isn't regulated at all. They are self-regulated. To put it simply, they are regulated by the will of the market. Capitalism, always finding a way to ruin things. And if you know anything about medicine, that is fucked. Therapists, counsellors, psychologists, life coach, gurus, none of it is regulated. There are groups, people, and specialists, including one of the psychologists I spoke to, fighting and advocating for proper regulations. But it is an uphill battle. If we can't even get these genuine accredited professions regulated, how are we supposed to get self-help and coaching under control? The last thing I did was to try to get in contact with as many people tangentially involved in this story as I could. I wanted to know how Ming Kuang appeared to people outside of his bubble. Aside from a couple of stragglers from other parts of society, I mainly reached out to the people he interviewed for his books. A portion of the people he interviewed were just normal people, non-public figures. I decided not to drag them into this and just focus on public entities like activists, politicians, and selected specialists, people and organizations who were already in the public light. I put a not insignificant time vetting them to make sure they have some level of public notoriety. Because I don't want to just drag someone from the mental health space into a spotlight like this if they are not equipped or versed in it. Four of them were kind enough to reply. Two of them were members of parliament. They told me they did not know of Ming Kuang before the book, nor did they remain in close contact afterwards. From what I can tell, Ming Kuang simply co-messaged them. He used their names and reputations to build up his own and to reinforce his legitimacy with his followers. These people are victims as well. Their names have been used to indirectly coerce people into an abusive community. Names that were meant to be pillars of support for the mental health community. They have been tarnished and they deserve our sympathy. At least that's what I wanted to say. For the four people that replied, that vision is definitely true. To the best of my reputation, I can clear their names. The problem is, I reached out to a total of 20 entities and only 4 properly replied. Of the remaining 16, 10 of them participated in the books and 6 of them are members of our parliament.
Um, hi everyone, I just want to issue a correction here. I won't have time to reshoot my entire monologue because I've already been working on this for months now and I'm at the tail end of my editing process. So this is gonna have to do. There were actually nine members of parliament who participated in the book, including the two that I previously showed you, James Lim and Patrick Tay. The mistake is I said I contacted six others when actually I can only confidently say I contacted five, which will be the ones that you see on screen right now. The other two members of parliament who participated in the books were MP Tin Pei Ling, who I straight up forgot to contact because I'm an idiot, and MP Xia Qian Peng, who I accidentally misaddressed as Mr. Chan instead of Mr. Xia in my email to him, so I can't confidently say that that email reached him. That's on me, and I can't stress enough how unqualified I am to do any of this. I'm not a trained journalist, it really shouldn't be me doing this. But somehow it is, I, that's the whole point of this video, I guess. Anyway, back to the monologue. If I say six people, I actually mean five. That's it. Thanks. And you might be thinking, Fat man, why can't you just give them the benefit of the doubt? They are, after all, powerful and busy individuals. They might not have the time or bandwidth to reply to every single email from randos on the internet. There are two problems with that train of thought. From the four that replied, I know that Ming Kuang used cold messages. If I assume with the greatest of good faith that he cold messaged everyone, why did they answer his random cold message and not mine? The second problem is this person. Member of Parliament of Ni Sun GRC, Carrie Tan Hui Min. She has openly said in an interview in 2022 that Hun Ming Kuang is a healer and teacher and that she had plans to bring him to South Korea which he did end up in. She is also a coach herself. Carrie Tan, unequivalently, has a severe conflict of interest in this story. Given the incredible seats of power and influence that some of these interviewees hold, if they do not reply to my call message through official channels, I can only assume they were contacted through other means, like through the mutual contact of a certain member of parliament. I cannot confirm that Ming Kuang's influence didn't spread to them through his follower, true carry Tan. I cannot discount that conflict of interest being possible. And because of that, almost every single one of those interviewees are now tainted by this small batch of incredibly powerful people in positions of high influence, not living up to their required responsibility. I can no longer trust anything they put out on this topic, and the topic of mental health in general, as a reliable source. I cannot tell you for certain that they aren't trying to hide something. And it hurts. Because a lot of these people are open mental health advocates who I have no choice but the pain as losing trust in the community. And you might think I'm overreacting, but working on all my videos for this channel, I have reached out to many people for information or interviews. And 9 out of 10 times they reply, even if just to tell me they aren't interested. Remember when I mentioned Gilly Jenkinson and Janja Lilac earlier? I messaged them a random guy from across the globe, and even they had the decency to write a formal reply to tell me they are too busy to participate. This 2 out of 10 only silence is not normal. People like them, people like me, have a social obligation to use our platforms when available to stand up for the causes we advocate for, especially when it's tough. Sorry for the impromptu setup and possibly terrible audio quality, but this is the second to the last day I'll be editing my video and I'm not sure how much of this I'll be able to include in, but I just watched CNA Talking Point do a piece on life coaches in Singapore. Uh, it's it's pretty okay, it's, it's fine. It has that both sides-ism that is very common in modern journalism that I absolutely despise, but at least they're covering the topic. The final interview in the story was by a person who goes anonymously by the name of Harry. Harry is one of the victims of Hun Ming Kuang as well. I just wanted to clear some things up. None of the things in the video was wrong. Everything is uh, true, surface level, but true. You know, it's 
Fine, it's a good entry point. Um, anyway, Quinn Lam, one of the life coaching beneficiary featured at the start, was the partner of Hun Ming Kuang in the artistic duo Honey and Lamy. So I wouldn't trust that as an unbiased source. Sylvia, the life coach featured in this video, she partners with a person named... What's his thing? I mean, Daniel Lim. Sylvia Chan and Daniel Lim partners on something called Little Labs. And Daniel Lim is... A person who has done, oh Jesus Christ, I don't even know how to talk about him. SA trigger warning, he has openly suggested that if you were sexually assaulted in the workplace, it, it's your fault. Not joking. I just want you to know that. I'm not shitting on CNA talking point, I'm just, I just need you to know who they are. Doing this video on Hun Ming Kuang, I've, I've seen shit that I can't, I can't. So, two of them are problem. If I'm not wrong, Queen actually does photography for either Little Labs or Daniel. So, um... It, yeah! Ooh, good, 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 good job. No, no problems there. Fuck me. Do you have anything to say for the people who are still in it? Take a step back from whatever it is you're doing. Okay, like right now you are so immersed in it, but I think that is where it, com it becomes tricky. Yeah, so uh, for those who are still in it, I would just um, advise you to be careful because MK can seem like he cares about me because I felt that way. It felt like he cared about me a period of time, like he cared about my process, he was proud of me, he said a lot of encouraging things, but I feel like it's all manipulation at this point. Don't get so immersed in it until you can't see everything else because that's what happened to me. I was so immersed. I felt like I am the problem, I need to work harder, I need to trust the process more, take a step back and reflect on everything as a whole so you can see the bigger picture and not just be in this bubble where you're just doing whatever he says, trusting the process, or I hate that, trust the process. Uh, how are you now? I mean, so now it's definitely I'm trying to recuperate, I'm trying to like pay back my uh, loans and stuff like that. Uh, definitely, if you say that to Get back whatever that I've lost. At the moment, I don't see it feasible. And I hope to use this to, like, educate others. The victims shouldn't have to do these exposés themselves. Journalists, police, member of parliament. Someone in the public sector should be doing it. Not the victims, and definitely not me. Some random guy on YouTube. For a while, I also fell into this moral sink. I found out through my grapevines that there were official institutions working on investigating Ming Kuang. I thought I could wait until those investigations were published before making my video. It would provide me with protection, with sourceable, quotable covers, so that I wouldn't be easily targeted by Ming Kuang through legal means. But as I waited, as the estimated time for release turned from weeks to months, I watched as the victims I knew slowly lose hope, grasping at extreme straws, trying to fight a fight they weren't equipped for, against the subject of one of their greatest trauma, while everyone they were relying on for help slowly went quiet. I am not a journalist. I can't distance myself from this story. I'm a guy, just a normal guy with zero professional empathy apparently. I couldn't help but feel that pain. The number of times in this past year where I have heard official institutions and entities tell victims to be careful of defaming their abuser filled me with an unspeakable level of disgust. Because I told them that as well. And even though I know, legally, that was the right move. It definitely didn't feel moral. Ming Kuang gets to get away with allegations of abuse, while victims are frightened to even call him names. We gave these victims less leeway than the person who perpetrated the horrors they've been made to experience. When people talk about being anti-woke, anti-cancel culture, this is the culture they want to normalize. A culture where victims of crimes and abuse must advocate for themselves, where we can't be aware, awoken, to the systemic injustice in our backyards. 
because it's uncomfortable to think about. We prefer our safety as innocent bystanders than the empathy of caring for victims. Because that's us, isn't it? The cult of Singapore. We have created a culture that lets group like this connect and people like Hun Ming Kuang thrive. An entire country of people, scared and terrified of doing and standing up for the right thing. A system that has punted the responsibility of mental health to an unregulated community, instead of treating it like the medical epidemic it is. Public officials more likely to worry about their persona than the personas under their governance. And finally, us, as people, who continue to advocate for scam awareness as some sort of personal responsibility, instead of putting regulations into laws that prevents this from happening, advocating for victims to have more agency, or at least make prosecutions and legal protections more easily available for them. In a Reddit post made by one of these victims, they wrote, I know that there will be some people who will mention how dumb of me and the other victims were to fall for this guy's scam. I hope people can be understanding that none of us were equipped nor wanted this. We accepted responsibilities of our poor choices. They shouldn't have to accept any responsibility. They didn't do anything wrong. They were just living their life. They were targeted while they were vulnerable by someone who they thought they could trust, someone who abused the reputation built up with other people's names and then used that to abuse followers, take advantage of them and had them hand over ungodly sums of money. It's like we're telling the victims of robbery that they shouldn't carry wallets instead of telling people not to be robbers. Don't get scammed is the same level of advice as don't get robbed. If someone who can't properly defend themselves, someone vulnerable, gets robbed, like an old person or paraplegic, we don't tell them to just not get robbed. In the same vein, someone who is undergoing mental health issues shouldn't be blamed for getting psychologically robbed. At the time of filming this, this connect is still active, funneling dozens if not hundreds of people through their pipeline every year. The victims, they aren't exceptions. They are the rule. They are normal people, like you, like me. Anyone can become them. The gurus and scammers and cult leaders, they are the exceptions. They are the ones that are breaking society. Right now, this culture and system that we have that supports them, this is normal and it really shouldn't be. Swear I won't forget this, why do I regret this? In my mind reckless, thoughts are feeling endless Sitting up I'm breathless, anxiety's infectious I feel so defenseless, betrayed and embarrassed I hate being open, I hate being broken I feel like an ocean filled up with emotion Anger ain't a potion, rub it on like lotion I can feel it soaking, reopen, the scars have awoken I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go